So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Eamon Ryan is my name. You've been, there's a takeover of the Green Party here today of the Institute of International and European Affairs. I'm glad to be joined by my colleague, the head of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, Claire Bailey, MLA, and my colleague, Councillor Kieran Cuff, who will be running for us in the European elections. And more than anything else, to my right, by the co-chair of the European Green, the European Green Group in the European Parliament, Philippe Lambert. Um, I've known Philippe for I know, 15, 20 years now yeah. in our work together uh, on a whole variety of different issues. And he's someone I trust, uh, which is an important thing in politics. Um, and I'm very glad that he's here today. We're part of a series of engagements, not surprisingly, uh, connected to the whole Brexit process. It's centre stage at the moment. Philippe is on the um, special subcommittee in the European Parliament. Um, what's it called? It's not a subcommittee. Brexit steering group. Steering group, yeah. um, which is... Um, assessing the whole Brexit negotiations from that place. He's a very uh, influential voice. Um, so we're looking forward to meeting the Taoiseach later on today and, uh, and engage, having a series of engagements with the political system here. But I think it's really appropriate he's here in the Institute for, we can bring up Brexit, but for have a slightly wider conversation and as part of the work that the Institute does here in looking at the future of Europe as part of that wider dialogue that's taking place, needs to take place right across the, the Union uh, I think it was a really good opportunity to get him in his address to us to set out some of his personal vision, to set context for the future, a green vision maybe if I call it, for the future of Europe, um, where we are today and, uh, and what might come next. Brexit will obviously come into it, we'll, we'll have his speech, but then broaden it out in a, in a question and answer, all of which will be videoed, so it, it'll be slightly different to usual. If you're asking a question, it'll be there forever in zeros and ones. Yeah on the internet and um but i think it's a very timely event and very we very i very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh hear philippe here uh and, and and for the conversation that will follow philippe you're very welcome if you want to maybe stand or, or do you uh, prefer to sit no i think I'll, I'll speak from here if that is That's okay good. with you ah yeah well then you don't see me so well well thanks a lot uh i'm really happy to be again in dublin it's been a long time uh, since uh, I last came here, it was for a Council of the European Green Party. Uh, I'm not even sure I was already an MEP. That would make it more than 10 years. Anyway, future of Europe. Flashback 24 months, 36 months. Uh, we have the Brexit referendum. We have uh, Trump elected in the US. We see uh, national populist parties on the rise all over, all over Europe. Uh, even in, in staunchly pro-European countries, such as mine or, or yours, we see uh, an anti-Europe sentiment uh, rising, uh, or at least a receding enthusiasm. Uh, so the blind faith in, in ever closer union seems to be uh, receding. And even six months ago, it was basically a given that the next European elections would produce uh, massive gains for the national populists and would uh, basically put the future of the European Union in question. And actually, uh, I have many reasons to hope. Uh, not because we have the future of Europe debates in the European Parliament and we hear many good words, uh, but because it seems that the worst is never certain. Uh, look at the last uh, uh, few elections we had in 2018, uh, national populists were set to make huge gains, uh, be number one in Sweden, they ended up number three. Uh, Wilders was going to win the Dutch election, it didn't. Uh, yes, they did win in Italy, obviously. Uh, they did win to a large extent in uh, Austria. Uh, but they are not basically winning uh, the public opinion battle. So it seems that indeed the worst is not really certain. And uh, what really uh, gives me courage is what happened in October, of course. Uh, on the same day, uh, on a, a Sunday, the 14th, uh, you have elections in Bavaria, in Luxembourg, and in Belgium. So regional, national, municipal in Belgium. And you see that apparently, if you're not happy with mainstream policies whose, uh, for which the EU has become an emblem, well, then maybe uh, there's another alternative than national populism. And I'd like to dwell a bit on that, because my reading of the 
uh, rising disenchantment about the European Union has little to do with nationalism. Of course, we do have nationalism in Europe, quite obviously. I mean, we see that in large countries that once were global superpowers, and of course, English nationalism is one of the drivers of Brexit. We have French nationalism. France also was once a global superpower. Ireland never was. Belgium never was. But then you have other forms of nationalism. We have Flemish nationalism in Belgium uh, because a culture has been repressed for a long time. And uh, the, the, the scars of this, uh, this uh, repression are still, uh, are still there, at least in the, in the public memory. But nationalism cannot be the explanation. There's something else that makes these parties grow and grow, reach the 20s, the 30s, sometimes the 40s uh, in, the, uh, in the electorate. And my reading of that uh, is that, well, when you have people who feel that they are being left behind, and it can be left behind economically, it can be left behind culturally, or when they are not left behind, but they feel they might be the next ones being left behind, and that they feel left behind not because of climate change, but because of political decisions, political choices. And the European Union is being often portrayed as the place where these political choices are made, or the alibi why these political decisions are made, well, then you turn against the European Union. If neoliberal globalization is basically done at the behest of the European Union, well, then let's turn against the European Union. It's not that we are nationalists, and you will hear many, uh, uh, many people who are totally uh, disenchanted by the EU, uh, well, positively saying, we are not nationalists. But the European Union is a neoliberal construction. You hear Jeremy Corbyn saying that. Uh, and he's not alone saying that on, 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 the, on the left side, of the left uh, side of the aisle. Um, well, then, uh, maybe there's some reason there. And uh, I mentioned over lunch, uh, uh, look at the Belgian prime minister who promised uh, in the electoral campaign he would never, ever postpone the legal retirement age. And that's one of the first things he did, once in power. Why? Because the European Union is asking us, who is the European Union? Well, there's one body that proposes legislations, and that's the Commission. Who are the commissioners? Unelected bureaucrats? Absolutely not. They are politicians designated by the 27 national governments, who are in turn accountable to their parliament and there to their voters. It's the Council and Parliament. Parliament? Well, 751 people directly elected by citizens. We are not unelected bureaucrats, we are politicians. And the council, 27 heads of states and government, accountable to their parliament, again. So, it's not unelected bureaucrats, it's politicians making political choices. But oftentimes, hiding behind the complexity of Brussels, or the country-specific recommendations of Brussels, not to have to pay the political price of reforms that they are making. Uh, it can be labor market reforms, it can be prolonging uh, glyphosate, it can be uh, permitting uh, cars to emit much more than legally allowed. Uh, it can be many things. But they can say, well, it was Brussels, it was not us, because they don't want to pay the political price. And that actually is good news. That is good news because if the policies that are carried out by the European Union uh, are, well, at the level of the European Union, are basically consists basically of adapting the countries of this continent to the neoliberal version of globalization, because there's not one single version of globalization. Well, the current version we have is a political choice. Um, well, it's because the political majorities want this. I mean, two-thirds of the European Parliament ratified CETA, the free trade agreement with Canada, which is basically a free trade agreement that mostly benefits capital owners. That's fact. So it's one of those many factors that increase the rent extraction capability of the capital owners. If you want to call them the rich, fine, but let's use a technical, terms, uh, a technical term. Uh, well, there was a majority 
there could have been another majority saying, well, no, we don't want this. And that means that, well, uh, even at the European level, different majorities can do different things. And that's, that's basically uh, uh, what makes me hopeful, because indeed, it would have seemed that Emmanuel Macron was pushing in that direction, and still does, actually, uh, that the choice was between either you're European, you're pro-Europe, or you are a national populist. So either you're progressive, pro-European for an open society, or you're anti-Europe, which basically is a way to confirm that there's only one version of the European Union, of the European project, and that's a neoliberal one. I remember pretty well when my predecessor, Danny Cohn-Bendit, came to the, Europe, uh, the, the, the Green Group in the European Parliament, uh, pushing us to join Macron. We, we said exactly, no way. We, we, we said, we do not want to confirm this idea that the national populists are pending as well, that there's one version of Europe, and that is a neoliberal version, and Corbyn is saying that, basically. Uh, and so if you want other policies, there's no other way than quit. Whereas we say, no, if you want other policies, elect different majorities. And so it's not like it's a, it's a how should I say, two-way competition. It's a three-way competition that we are looking at. It's a competition between who will present the most de desirable and credible alternative to the neoliberal version of the European integration that is currently mainstream. And indeed, one alternative is the national populist one, and the other one is the one that we Greens are uh, bearing. We, we do not have exclusive rights on that version, but we are, I think, drivers of that positive pro-EU alternative. And I'd like to, to structure this three-way debate this way. If you look at the neoliberal ideology uh, that is grounded in neoclassical economics, at the root of society, actually there's no such thing as society as uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, but at the root of uh, human groups, there's the homo economicus, which is driven by the maximization of its utility, of its utility function. And in the utility function, you have only one thing. Th well, you have several things, but only things that have a price enter into that utility function. Something that has no price has no value. We are just driven by things that can be monetized, that can be priced. And the free and unfettered competition of everyone with everyone produces the optimum for society, right? This is, of course, bullshit science. Bullshit science. I mean, if you look at the evidence, and there may be trained economists here, but the neoclassical economists have been proven wrong by real life. And the usual reaction of neoclassical economics is if reality doesn't fit the model, reality is wrong, which is the definition of religion. <laughs> I want to make society a better place. Follow neoclassical economic textbooks. That's a new religion, but it has nothing to do with describing societies and human beings as they are. But this is predicated on a vision of me, myself, the individual, first person or the singular. And in a way, if you listen to the national populists, they bring back the we at the center. It's us. It's not me, it's us. But the way they define the first person of the plural is us against them. Them can be, well, these Arabs who want to invade us, and that's uh, a fairly uh, often used version. It can be the cosmopolitan capitalism, but it's us against them, basically. And we agree that we have to bring back the first person of the plural in the center but all version of we is an inclusive one, one that basically says, look at the challenges that we have to face. Look at climate change. Look, indeed, at asylum and migration. Look at the power of multinationals. Look at, uh, at uh, rising inequality. These are all challenges that, that are beyond the capabilities of any individual. But together, we may find the solution. We're not certain. We are not making you the promise that all societies have what it takes to answer that. 
but we do believe that there's a chance. That there's a chance if we are able to, I wouldn't say to unite, because it's, it, it gives the impression that, well, all societies are, are just uniform. They are not. They are, they are uh, uh, plural. Uh, but uh, that if we work together, the we can find answers to the challenges of this century. And, and again, what I saw in October, what I saw ever since, uh, uh, shows that this, we, this version of the we has traction. And I take, I take uh, courage from two phenomena that we have seen uh, blooming in my part of Europe, so Belgium, France, uh, uh, say uh, the old member states, it's this dual movement of climate marches and, and frankly speaking, you know, the annual climate march, march before the, 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 the COP, the annual COP in Belgium used to uh, gather five to 10,000 people. This year, 75,000. And you know what? There was a repeat one in January, again, 75,000 people. And in between, you have 30,000 people young people demonstrating every Thursday, so I'm not there to, uh, today, in the streets to demand action from the government. And, of course, that movement is not as strong in all parts of Europe, but it came to the surface. And a bit before then, that was November, the yellow vests. And you might say, you were green? Are you, well, see hope in the yellow vest? Absolutely. Of course, there's everything in the yellow vest. But if you listen to the people who demonstrate, they demonstrate against injustice, social injustice. So they are not demonstrating uh, because, well, you know that these demonstrations started because, because of a hike in fuel prices. And so, yeah, because of green taxes. Not exactly, actually, because of international markets. But of course, they were compounded by green taxes. But when you listen to those people, they do not demonstrate against... Uh, the transition. They want the transition to be just, <coughs> to be fair, to make sure that those who have the broadest shoulders carry the largest uh, share of the effort, which is a human expectation, right? And at the same time, they demonstrate for a real democracy. And in a way, it's perfectly logical. If the, if inequality is rising, and especially if taxes are unjust, it's because parliaments are adopting those taxes. And they must be wrong if parliaments who are supposed to defend the general interests vote taxes that favor the happy few. So something must be rotten in all democracies if we have to judge by the result. And so the two demands that they pose, so more just taxes, a more inclusive democracy are actually intermingled. They are, they are linked with one another. An oligarchic system will produce oligarchic laws. A democratic system will produce democratic laws. That's, that's, a, that's a basic thing. So actually, I see those two movements, the, the, the green vests and the yellow vests, as actually being, uh, well, they come from two different angles. I would say they, 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 they embody the two time bombs or societies are sitting on, rising inequality and rising ecological footprint, but solving these goes hand in hand. There will be no ecological transition if it's not just, and then all societies will collapse. So if you want ecological transition to happen, it has to be just, it has to be democratic. Because, well, sometimes, and that's just an aside, but... And, and that comes more often these days. I hear people asking me seriously, well, when we see the global ecological urgency, is democracy the right way to tackle it? In other terms, don't we need an enlightened despot to lead us into the hard reforms that need to be made? My usual answer is to say, no, unless I can be the despot. <laughs> But then again, I think twice because, well, you know, being a despot is a full-time job and I like to have my free time and my family time, so if I can be a half-time despot, it's fine. Uh, no, seriously, actually, those who would think uh, along these lines forget one thing, is that we do not have, and the neoliberals remind us that daily, we do not have the map, the plan of the ideal society, of the just, sustainable, democratic society. We have to invent it. 
We do not have the GPS that leads us from where we are to where we need to be. We have to invent it. And no one, even Emmanuel Macron, no one is bright enough to understand this world. So only collective intelligence can help us here. And there you need a reinvented democracy. Because if you look at democracy as we practice it, <laughs> it's basically a competition between competing elites who claim to know what is good for society. And so, well, believe more in me than them because, well, they, they don't understand this world, we understand it better, and so vote for us. But actually, that is democracy, maybe not 101, but it, it's uh, uh, the pre previous version of democracy. Can we reinvent our democracy so that they become instruments to leverage collective intelligence? Because you might say that this model was fine when the education level in society was quite low. I, I mean... Many people were, were, were so linked to their daily lives that they, they, they could not possibly fathom the depth of the issues that we needed to tackle, but no longer. I mean, people are educated, they're not stupid. And can we reinvent our democracy so that they become more inclusive? Random selections of representatives, uh, well, more participative democracy as we see in Switzerland or in California, well, these are avenues that should be uh, explored. But what, again, what I'm saying, back to the yellow and, and green vest, what I see is that it's a, a repoliticization of society, quite obviously, not in a party politician uh, sense of the word, but really, well, people want to think by themselves about what, how their societies are working. And uh, they see that the social and the environmental dimension are linked. Now, interestingly, the yellow vests and the Green vests are not the same people. If you, if you go and meet with people from the climate marches, you will see people who are usually well of typically green voters. If you go meet with yellow vests, these will, will be people with whom at least we Greens uh, have not engaged quite a lot the last few years. But there's opening. There, there, there's opening to do so. But uh, you can see that these people come from very different cultural backgrounds. Uh, and, and that is, to me, a source of comfort to see, well, neither the yellow vest, and of course some do, but most, the bulk of the yellow vest, are not just embracing national populism. They are not. They are not talk with them. They are not. And of course the green vests are, aren't either. So that means that there is real space for, say, a positive we alternative to the dictatorship of my short-term profit at the expense of everything else, the planet, the planet or my fellow uh, uh, human beings. Uh, there, there's, a, there's space for that positive answer. And this is where I do take courage. So uh, I do not believe that Europe is doomed. I do not believe that you can keep the European project ju just by scaring people and saying, look at Brexit. Huh? Do you really want that to happen to you? No. So please stay in line. Um, that is not enough. You need a positive project. But actually, Europe can be that positive project. And, 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 and I'll finish there. I mean, some on my left will say, well, Europe is neoliberal, so you have to get out of it. Or you have to change the treaties. But as you know, to change the treaties, you need that something called unanimity. And I keep saying, well, you know, to change the common agricultural policy, you need another majority. To make the fight against climate change and the ecological and just transition, the core project of the European Union, you don't need unanimity. You need a majority. To stop passing the kind of free trade deals that we are passing currently, you don't need unanimity. You just need a different majority. To change the country-specific recommendations and to, for instance, put at, the heart, at their heart reduction of inequalities, reduction of our ecological footprint, you don't need to treaty change. You need another majority. And I could go on and on and on and on. So please, don't break the instrument that Europe is, because it's a very powerful one, and I would say it's the most powerful one we have. Because if we want to, fa to face climate change, if we want to face uh, the migration challenge, if we want to tame the multinationals, it won't be Ireland, it won't be Belgium, but it won't be Germany. It's, well, we need leverage. And there, the single market gives us the leverage that we want because I know no multinational who would just 
well, forget about the single market uh, as a key market to serve. We can dictate our conditions. Market access is the leverage. If you destroy the European Union, we will be played by multinationals and by Putin and by Xi Jinping and by Erdogan and by Daesh. If we want to be players and not to be played, it's together. You know, the, the, the motto of Belgium is uh, l'union fait la force, or union makes you strong. And the motto of the European Union is unity in diversity. And I believe that actually the two go together. Unity in diversity makes us strong to face the challenges of, of these times. And you know what? When I speak that language to citizens, it does resonate. So we'll see in a few months' time whether, well, we see that in the numbers, but I'm reasonably confident. So thank you. I'm just slightly nervous because I looked out in our, in, our, in our audience here today, in our, in our room, there are some classical, classical e e uh -huh, e yeah. e economists. Well, maybe they're not. Maybe I'm, I, I'm, uh, but, um, Philippe, that's a very, uh, thank you very much for that very broad outline of your vision, a green vision for future of Europe. Um, I'm happy to throw it out to, the, to anyone who might want to pick up one of the threads and run with it. Sue. If you, if you introduce yourself first. Um, my name is Sue Stott, previously with the Economic and Social Research Institute. I've never known what sort of economist to call myself, <laughs> but I just think that uh, you can't really say that about neoclassical economists because Pigou was 100 years ago, and he changed economics, really. And so since then, we've had this huge understanding that there's far more to it than just the simple human optimization. Yeah. There is a whole raft of externalities over there which isn't even priced, and we have to put them into the equation. If we don't put them in the equation, uh, humanity is lost. Um, so that what, I don't know what sort of economist I am. And perhaps I'm not a neoclassical economist, but I always thought I was. Um, but I just have a question, and that is really to do with the press and uh, free speech, press, control of the press, press barons being tax evaders. We've seen yeah. that with the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail, who had a motive for distorting the truth. Uh, I, th I think that's part of the narrative. What do you think? Well, uh, first, on, on uh, we have to internalize the externalities. Yes, to some extent. But again, what do we say to describe something that has uh, immense value to us? It is priceless some st stuff cannot be priced. And, and that is what I keep saying. Uh, I'm an engineer. I minored in economy, uh, but uh, I'm an engineer. I know thermodynamics. There's limits to what you can do in reality. So, well, I, I, I'm okay if you can poof, poof, put an infinite price, but then what's the point? What's the point? Because it destroys your equation. No, uh, the, the key thing is that, again, to neoclassical economists, Eco the, the economic theory encompasses everything, whereas, in my view, the economy is the subset, a subset of human life. There's loads of things in my life that are not economic, that will never be captured by economic theory, and that's a very good thing. The problem is that policy today is driven by one thing, economists, the economicus. I know it's a bit more complex, but, but the thing is that basically the driver, if, if this is profitable, we should do it. What are the impact studies of the European Commission? It's about profit. It's about profit. If it's profitable, it needs to be done. When, when the car industry is saying no, uh, ambitious CO2 targets because this will destroy jobs. Well, they want to say it will destroy profits. Uh, it's basically, okay, it's okay to poison, it's okay to kill, as long as it's profitable. And I refuse this logic that, well, basically profit is the driver. That's, that's basically is a worldview that I don't share and that actually I fight against. So I want to be very clear about that. So yes, uh, uh, these, uh, these zealots, because they are all these Talibans. Uh, I mean, when, when I read some people around uh, Jean Tirole, the, the, the former Nobel uh, 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 Prize in Economics, uh, 
who were claiming and who are claiming that economics as a science has gotten to the point where it can describe reality as well as the laws of gravity can describe gravitation. We are an exact science. How oh, dare them? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a manifest written in France. You might say, okay, the French economists are a special, <laughs> special species. But, but no, they wrote it. They claim this. I mean, that's a, these are Talibans, just Talibans. They are religious zealots. Now, back to, uh, uh, to your question about the press. That's a difficult one because on the one hand, what you described about the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and, and, and uh, the not-so-free press in Poland and, uh, and uh, Hungary is all true. And on the other hand, I see that uh, someone like uh, Edwy Plenel, formerly a boss of Le Monde, can create Mediapart in France with little money and create a medium that is profitable, that has 200 and some, some journalists uh, doing investigative work and asking 90 euros a year as a subscription fee. So there's a room for free and independent press. Same thing. I can, of course, you might say, well, Facebook is, uh, is biased and all the rest of it. I can use these tools to convey views that are unorthodox. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's not as if people cannot choose. They can. So I'm not sure that I would... Uh, well, how, how should I say? You, you may, of course, choose as a policy to say, OK, I will subsidize some media uh, to ensure diversity. What I may do is try to make sure that uh, the big ones do not have uh, monopoly power. And there we, we can do some stuff. One of these ideas that, uh, that, uh, that I harbor is why don't we give uh, every citizen <coughs> from age, I don't know what, uh, an information budget that he or she can spend on any medium. So we are not subsidizing media directly. We are subsidizing people, but we are giving them an information budget and they spend it wherever they like, as long as it's a medium. And there you have to have rules that define what a medium is. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't have the answer. I would say that by and large in Europe at the moment, not in every country, but we still have, well, I would say for citizens who want to have independent information, they can get access to it. We are not in China, and I'm glad we are not. Uh, and on the other hand, if you want to start a medium, an independent medium, in most European member states, you can do that. It's, some, it's really hard. But so, yes, it is a, a, a key issue, but not one that keeps me awake at night. I, I may be mistaken, I don't know. But uh, at the moment, I do not see that we are in a, in a well, and again, barring examples such as uh, Hungary or, or, or Poland or maybe a few others, but I would say that by and large in Europe, you still can get access to free, uh, unbiased information. Okay, another question. If you introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, I'm Eugene Downs, member of the Institute. Uh, Philippe, can I ask you, what are the green proposals for further EU political integration, if any, in the next five to ten years? Uh -huh. uh, are you talking policy or institutions? Institutions. Well, maybe I, I, I'll shock you because... Uh, uh, we do not believe that the institutional debate is a key one. I have countless ideas, and we have countless ideas as to how to change stuff. Uh, there's tiny things that you can do that, uh, that, uh, that can have some uh, resonance, but I'm not happy with a system where people from the executive branch become legislators. I hate it. I mean, the council should not exist. Uh, you should have a, a, a chamber of the states, and a well, a Senate, basically, and a, and a, a European Senate and a European uh, lower chamber. Uh, I would be much more comfortable with that. But are we going to get that anytime soon? No, and I don't want to waste any co political capital on that. Why is that? Again, and I try to explain that. Of course, I would change many things in the treaty. I would simplify the treaties. I think, actually, that there's a lot of policy stuff in treaties that, that doesn't belong there. A treaty basically is a constitution. Constitution is about basic values and basic institutions. 
and we should limit it to that. And all the rest should be left to policymakers to decide. Do we want uh, do we want to be able to perform Keynesian policy, uh, uh, economic policy? Yes, why not? Uh, uh, but then again, that's a political choice. But we are not going to reform the treaties anytime soon. Uh, is it fair to write in a treaty a neoliberal uh, uh, provision such as it is prohibited for the central bank to buy public debt? This, is, this has nothing to do with, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, a constraint of nature. Same thing with the 3%, uh, the, the, the deficit rule, 3% of GDP max, uh, the debt rule, 60% of GDP max, no scientific basis, doesn't belong there. That's again, ideology. You don't want to put too much ideology into treaties. But again, I don't want to waste energy on that. Why? Because again, social emergency, environmental emergency, many things can be done without treaty change. The more political capital you spend on institutional reform, the less you have to spend on policy changes. And you know what? All people demand policy changes. They don't care about the way the institutions work with one another. Uh, that's for, for us to decide. What they want is output legitimacy, first and foremost. The gilets jaunes and the, 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 the green vest, the, the, they want different policies. And this is where we want to spend political capital. So if you look... Uh, Within our program, you will find some stuff on reforming the Eurozone and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, again, institutional reform is not the key thing. You know, and there are some institutional reforms that I may end up ne being negotiating for uh, four months from now uh, that have no place in treaties. It's like, well, impact assessment. What if we decide that impact assessment is first about impact on social inequality and on ecological footprint? And oh, by the way, we can look at the economic winners and losers of any reform we take, but we will judge any reform, any law that we want to pass in Europe first on their impact on social justice and on ecological footprint. That would be a revolution. That is just an internal rule of the Commission. Political choice. This is much more important. And you might say, yeah, but you will bump into the limits of the treaties. Yes, of course. It's prohibited for the central bank to buy public debt. How come the European Central Bank ends up owning 25% of public debt at the moment? Ah, well, the Germans are right. We circumvented the treaty. And that's a good thing. You might say, yeah, it's political expediency. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an engineer. Uh, I want to make it work. And if we have to cut some corners sometimes, well, we have. We have to, especially if treaties are harboring misguided ideology so uh, uh, voila but but I won't spend a lot on uh, institutional reforms we have no time for that maybe someday we will dig deeper into that again but not now and that is a big difference with the far left competitors that we have who demand a treaty change otherwise they will uh, advocate exit of France or Austria or I don't know what no 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 that is not our way Thank you, Mike, Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for, for the exposition of, of your the Green position. And thank you indeed for the Greens' uh, work in, in the European Parliament. We've, we've had a number of other visitors from your party here with impressive achievements. Um, I, I, I am, however, just to come back to the, the trade issue, I'm a child of 1950s Ireland. I think your message is probably quite a hard one to sell in this country. Um, mm -hmm. Just like your country, we're a, a hugely um, trade-dependent nation. And the changes in this country from the 70s onwards have owed, they've owed a lot yeah. to different aspects of the yeah. European Union. But uh, two of them in particular, the, the creation of the internal market, the trade between us, the removal of barriers, and all the movements, that, the free movements that go with it. But secondly, the uh, liberalization of trade between the European Union and, and third countries has been enormously beneficial um, to this country. Mm -hmm. So my question is, I, you, you mentioned, I believe you mentioned your support for the internal market, uh, but you also instanced your opposition, if I understood rightly, to the Canada Free Trade Agreement. What would be your model 
for the European Union's future relationships in trade with countries, third countries, whether they are mm. uh, Canada, Japan, or indeed India? Mm. Thank you for asking the question, uh, because it's, it's really a crucial one. And you're right to point that the single market is the most accomplished free trade deal ever. But there's a big difference between CETA and the single market. You do have a single market that is ruled by democratic institutions at the same level as the single market, that is European Parliament and the European Council driven by the European Commission. You do not have an EU-Canada Parliament. You do not have a EU-Canada Council. You do not have a EU-Canada Commission. And when you, you say that you have free trade, absolutely free trade, between jurisdictions, how should I say? Let me put it this way. When the market is bigger than the democratic jurisdictions, the ultimate holder of sovereignty are the market players. And this is not democracy. Does that mean that we can have no free trade? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But ultimately, the jurisdiction must stay with democratically elected bodies. Why did we oppose CETA? Well, let me first take the democratic aspect and then I'll come to the ecological aspect. The democratic aspect is quite obvious. When you strive for regulatory convergence, and doing so, you want to, how should I say, curb the autonomy of legislators, both in Canada and Europe, to make decisions, because these would create non-tariff barriers to trade, because that's the way they used to call environmental, social provisions, uh, then I'm saying no. It cannot be. When you are giving a certain type of player called the investor, inappropriately so, don't forget that most people who call themselves investors are rent seekers because the investor is someone who takes a risk, right? So I'm betting money and, and resources right now, hoping for future profit. An investor is by definition someone who takes risk. When you look at today's investors, they want risk to be borne by society and profits to be carried by them. Hence, ISDS. No, you're an investor. You believe that the legal regime in Canada, not to be safe enough for you, don't invest there. You believe it's too risky to go to China, don't do it. But why should citizens carry the risk? You're an investor, earn your name. So no special treatment for investors. There's no reason to do that. That is ideological. That is totally ideological. And it's not by chance that Amcham, Europe, uh, 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 Business Europe, and all the rest were clinging to ISDS like this was a life and death issue. We can't accept this. We can't accept this. Public services. Why is it so that everything can be privatized except a tiny list of this, this, and this? Why is it that the rule is market? And the exception is collective management of commons. No, there's no reason. This is purely ideological. No place in such treaties. Now, let me come to the ecological part. And that's the engineer speaking. One more ton over one more kilometer, that's more ecological footprint. Why is it so that one of the key wins of Canada in the free trade deal has a number attached to it, 120,000 tons a year of what? Meat. You might think T-Rex meat, because what they have T-Rex is there and we don't in Europe, or kangaroo, no, that's Australia. Uh, no, beef and pork, as if, well, we can't breed these, these beasts in Europe. Yeah, but they do it differently there different taste. Give me a break. Industrial farming gives a different result over there than here. No, all markets are already saturated with meat. And we say, let another 120,000 tons come every year to Europe. What's the point? What's the point? 
So if trade deals are about increasing volumes, they are running counter the objective of reducing our ecological footprint. And Britain may discover that soon, that actually distance counts. Dreaming to replace the single market with China, with India, with Australia, or whatever, I mean, they are not placed exactly where Europe is placed. And especially, well, with rising climate change, we will feel the pinch. Therefore, uh, trade deals cannot be about volume. They must be about something else. And this is why we are not saying no trade deals. We are saying different trade deals. And those trade deals must leverage, again, market access. And by doing that, what you do is potentially exporting your norms. And that becomes interesting because when you have like-minded countries, and I hope that we can find allies, and in that sense, you might think, well, Canada was a good example. But Canada, if you look at the country on ecological terms, wanted to export tar sands oil. I mean, come on. You, well, I mean, Justin Trudeau was presented as, you know, the new kid on the block, uh, the greenest uh, prime minister of Canada. Give me a break. Again, look at the substance. What is it that we want to do business with with Canada? And um, if we can find, indeed, like-minded countries, we can agree, indeed, on common norms. That was the whole idea behind TTIP. But again, this was a system where norms would have been driven by downwards competition. This is not what we want. You might, you might have, I'm just dreaming, you might have free trade deals that basically say this. On every topic that is within scope, we decide that the most ambitious norm trumps the other. And then you start an upwards competition between legislatures. Because if we have such a provision between Canada and the EU, well, maybe the Canada Parliament will be more stringent on car emissions. Aha! And then their norms would be applicable to Europe. And likewise, we might be stricter on, I don't know, endocrine disruptors, and we might drive their legislation upwards. That would be a game changer. Do we want to go there? Do we want to go in a place where we say, we recognize that in some cases you need supranational jurisdictions to, uh, to decide over disputes linked to trade. I'm not saying no to that, but I'm saying fine. Investors are just one type of stakeholders. Consumers, NGOs, governments are all likely to want to go to such international jurisdictions at some point in time. So no special treatment. Everyone is welcome. It's a court that is accessible to any stakeholder. Fine by me. Fine by me. Let's do it. Because, you know, we are multilateralists. I prefer the WTO to bilateral deals. But can we make the WTO work for the people and not for multinationals to be a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, dichotomic? Uh, I hope so. But again, it takes political majorities. At the moment, the, the multilateral order doesn't look good. And this is why we are not saying, OK, protectionism. We are saying, let's do the right thing. If they're stuck, well, we, we will need to relocalize the economy to some extent. And don't forget David Ricardo. The, his theory of uh, comparative advantages is only valid, is only valid, and there's a footnote there, if there's no freedom of circulation of that thing called capital. In that case, indeed, Every country can benefit of specialization, but when you have free circulation of capital, which is the regime we are in, then indeed you have winners and losers, and then losers revolt. You want to continue that? We don't. So yes, we need to change course on trade deals. <coughs> now, will we find people who will want to deal with us on that basis? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but let's start with Europe. And uh, yes, we are interdependent, so not everything we consume here will be produced in Europe. But yes, we need to a degree, uh, uh, a degree of relocalization, also in terms of resilience. Because again, if you make your economy totally dependent, and Germany is learning this, and will be learning this the hard way the coming months, if you bet your entire economy on global trade, when your customers turn sour on you, you're in a bad place. And Germany will soon rediscover that the single market is uh, it's Heimat. That's where they belong. And the question there. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your address. Uh, my name is Aidy O'Doherty. I'm involved in various um, environmental grassroots groups. And um, I want to ask you about what you were saying about you know, the increased strikes, the increased mobilisation of people we're seeing out on the streets um, about climate change. And like, I think in, in activist groups, we tend to focus a lot of our efforts on trying to influence national policy. So what do you think we can do, particularly, particularly with the European elections coming up, to make our voices heard at the European level? And also, how do you think we can leverage this increased mobilisation, increased engagement to make actual policy changes in Europe? Well, first, I do not understand what is happening. I'm, I'm serious. I did not predict, and probably could not predict, that suddenly, uh, I mean, there, there was a, a, a government crisis in December on migration, on the U UN Compact on Migration. And now, climate change, and it goes beyond climate change because listen to the demonstrators, it's about biodiversity, it's about resource exhaustion, it's about the, the entire spectrum, is really uh, number one. I don't know how it came to be. I do not know. I do not know why it crystallized now. So you have to ask the people who organize the climate marches in, in Belgium, I don't know. I think they, they have been surprised as well that it catches now. I, I, I don't know how. Now, second thing, the European uh, level is absolutely crucial because, well, you said it in Ireland and Belgium is also one of the, those food draggers. We have to recognize that the impetus has been given more by the European level than the national level. So I do deplore that Europe is no longer the global champion it used to be, but still the European level is more ambitious than the national is. Obviously, and that's a good thing. Now, what, what I do believe is that indeed the climate marches, the demonstrations that we are seeing will increase the political pressure. I mean, it's really incredible that bar the Flemish nationalists in Belgium, everyone now says, well, we have to step up the ambition. Well, they, I mean, Belgium is a food dragging country, really food dragging. Maybe not as bad as yours, but frankly, 13% <laughs> uh, reduction in CO2, that is way too much. We won't be able to do it. So now, well, they feel forced. And again, that's democracy. Public opinion counts because people feel losing their seats. And that's a good thing. Uh, so, so yes, it will maybe have the next Belgian government being a, more a driving force at, at the European level. But actually, don't forget that the Commission also, to some extent, responds to the political climate. So if they feel that climate is going up, uh, the next European Commission might be more ambitious again. But if they feel that in most member states actually there's resistance, they will say, well, we are not going to waste political capital and to the hell with climate. Uh, but I have no advice to give you because I don't know how it happened. Uh, I, I'm just saying that, well, now, uh, obviously, uh, when, when I organize uh, uh, citizens' meetings, the number one preoccupation uh, is climate way before migration. And interestingly, if you look at the, at the Eurobarometer, it is also true, huh? because uh, uh, migration has seldom been on the number one position. So this is, this is the result of political instrumentalization. I mean, well, a number of political leaders uh, or followers actually uh, think that it is uh, expedient to, uh, uh, to, uh, to use that, uh, that topic to their advantage. But I'm not sure that this will... Uh, this will uh, still work in the next European election. But then again, Belgium is not the entire European Union. Eh? Uh, uh, we don't have climate marches in Poland. Uh, we had some marches on the Biario Vieja uh, forest um, in, uh, in Poland, but not so much on, on the climate issue. So, but, well, the more, the more MEPs uh, who are motivated for a paradigm shift uh, in the European Parliament, the more governments pushing in the same direction, the more chances we have to enact systemic change, because what we need is systemic change. And, and that's one thing that I also want to, to stress. You cannot have, and I think I, uh, I already hinted at that, you cannot have neoliberal globalization and the ecological and just transition. It's either or. And yes, it's scary. Because, well, we know what the system looks like and we don't know what it should look like, but we, again, we have to invent it. And we know that continuing on the neoliberal globalization will basically drive humanity uh, uh, into the wall, and a very thick one. So, uh, and don't forget 
and that's personal experience uh, that some think that actually we can solve the climate issue by drastically reducing the size of humanity. Just imagine that there's only a hundred million people on this planet. Makes the ecological equation much easier to solve. And if we don't need all these zillions people building the things that we, the rich, need, why should we keep them? No, no, I, I've, I've heard that kind of cynical language. So uh, that's what we are up against. We leave it in that cheery thought. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 we won't. <laughs> that won't be my last word. <laughs> no, it won't. I'm not sure. I, last I, question, and then we'll... Jacobs, actually, two, two questions. One is you, uh, you said that, um, quite rightly, that the Greens have done very well in some elections in, in Bavaria and in, in Belgium and done extremely well. How do you see them, ex the Green um, family, expanding its... Uh, scope to Central and Eastern Europe, where it's yeah. very weak, and in, and in certain other areas, and in particular the, the question of the lead candidates, where you have yeah. lead candidates, Fritz and Kandidaten, will they, will they manage to go round Europe? Because last time, the perception was very little followed here in Ireland. Mm. Uh, the perception was that it was all um, in the centre of Europe. The debates were in Brussels, were yeah, in Germany, and they didn't come out, for example, there were no debates, and none of the lead candidates came, came to here. Ireland at all. I mean, one did, Martin Schulz, mm. but he was only speaking to the Labour Party. Oh, so yeah. um, I just wonder how you do that. And my second question, no yeah. one has raised. It, it almost feels like pulling the discussion down after what you've been saying on the big themes, and that is Brexit. I heard you on the radio this morning mm. saying that the backstop should um, be defended, firstly, for the peace process, and secondly, for... Um, to defend the single market. But where in this moment of impasse that we have at the moment, where do you see it going? Well, uh, let me start with this one. I'll end on a more positive note. I, I'm, I'm not optimistic because I, I, I look at the British political class and I, I will not generalize, but uh, at least I, I see two... I don't know whether I have to call them leaders, but uh, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn who are obsessed by, the, uh, by power, basically. So I, in order to get, well, to keep Downing Street or to win it, I need to keep a semblance of unity in my ranks. And I will not do anything that divides uh, uh, my party to the point of breakup. So if that has to cost the country, fine. And that leads us to no deal Brexit. That's a, that's a reality. And, and this country is the, the one that will suffer, suffer most from it. But uh, at the moment, I do not see... Uh, people prepared to give up on short-term party political interests so as to reach a sensible deal in Westminster because at the point in time you need the British democracy whatever its, uh, its uh, shortcomings and they are big uh, to come to a, to a conclusion so, um, so the only things that I am seeing in Westminster is majorities against something I didn't see a positive majority yet so I sense there is but materializing it would break uh, both the Tory and the, the, the Labour parties. And that's, to, to me, to some extent, Brexit is the result of the first pass of post system. Really. Because this system forces bipolarization between two big parties, which almost by construction will harbor people of totally different opinions. And don't forget that the referendum was called in order to settle the EU question within the Tory party. Just imagine that you would have uh, a proportional representation vote in the uh, voting system in the UK. You would have had a nationalist right-wing party and a nationalist left-wing party and a pro-EU right-wing party and a pro-EU left-wing party. You would have a, co have a coalition regime and you would never have had a need for a referendum. And this is where, in the mother of all democracies, I'm not sure that the UK deserves that, uh, that name, no more that, the, that France deserves the, the name of being the, 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 the mother of uh, human rights. Uh, but uh, uh, that democracy is not working as a democracy should, I think. Um, and that's where, that's where we are. Now, I understand that Ska will be here, so Ska Keller, the, 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 the one of the two Spitzenkandidaten and, uh, of the Greens will be here next week. I'm here. It's not because you are or you are not a Spitzenkandidat that you are not campaigning for, for your party uh, 
outside of your uh, home turf. I mean, I, I'm wasting my time here. No voter can vote for me next, uh, uh, next May. Yet I find it important to be here. And I think that, well, people know that Greens are internationalists. We are going to support one another all over the place. Now, you're right to point out that the Green family uh, is not equally represented all across Europe. That's fact. Uh, we are we are strong say in central western well central uh, from Germany to Scandinavia and uh, and France etc but southern Europe we are not performing very well uh, and that's also our fault I mean uh, uh, in Italy we once were in government but we performed so badly that we were wiped out afterwards so uh, that's our fault uh, so we betrayed people's trust. Um, in Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, in the Baltic states, we are going to be well represented. Uh, it's close to Scandinavia, so uh, you, you might see a, a reason there. Uh, but it's true that at the moment, we do not have uh, substantial offers in countries like, uh, uh, like Poland or Romania or, or even Greece. So yes, we know our shortcomings, so that, that's fact. Uh, and uh, you should know that, of course, where we are successful, the Green parties are more, le uh, more or less uh, 30, 40 years old. Uh, in many other countries, the uh, Green parties are much younger and it takes time to, uh, to, get, uh, to get credibility. And, and one way of gaining it is indeed to import uh, people uh, uh, from uh, the outside, from successful Green parties. Now, there's what I would say organic growth and there's, uh, can I say that, growth by acquisition. Uh, it's a bit brutal, but I would, I sense, let, let me put it this way. I sense that on the one hand, because climate and environmental matters are becoming hotter on the agenda. And also because of our successes, I can imagine that other political forces, which are not labeled green in Europe, might want to join us. Five years ago, we were a bit seen as losers, you know, or also rents. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the case this time. And you might think two years ago, people would flock to Emmanuel Macron, so to Alde, to the liberals. But uh, how should I say uh, that, well, the image of being the new kid on the block and the successful guy uh, is a bit gone. So we will see. But uh, uh, I do believe that we stand a chance of... Uh, building a broader alliance because on one thing we are not crazy we know that uh, we will never have 50 percent plus one vote we greens and it's good for democracy by the way uh, so we will uh, build alliances and um, we might see for the first time ever in the european parliament a real coalition negotiation after the european election up until now you had this thing called the crowd coalition between EPP and socialists, where basically EPP would set the course and socialists would join in exchange for some positions. That's basically how the deal works. So there was never a real question or negotiation about the course of action. But you know that those two groups are very unlikely to, to have a majority uh, between them after the European election. So you will probably need a broader coalition if you want a stable coalition because you might say okay well we'll see and on every file we'll see what kind of majority we have but basically that means handing over the keys to the national populists who will decide wants to vote with the left want to wants to vote with the right do you really want to do that no i don't think so so if you want a stable majority in the european parliament there will be maybe for the first time ever in the european parliament a coalition negotiation we intend to be part of it, of the negotiation. We'll see whether we can get substantial progress. But, you know, the, the Spitzenkandidat process was seen as a progress for democracy, for European democracy. And there's some truth there. But it pales in comparison with what might be achieved uh, come May, June. Uh, that, just imagine that the Commission work program for the next five years would be basically written by the Parliament. That would be a sea change. And that's a real possibility. And this is why I'm so excited. This is going to be my last European election. 
uh, and my live selection uh, altogether. But uh, I'm really excited because once, as I said, green vest, yellow vest, people are repoliticizing. They do not accept that uh, the only answer to neoliberalism is national populism. Good news. Second, actually, maybe the rise of national populism creates an opportunity to work out of the box and maybe steer the European Union back towards where it belongs, that is putting human dignity at the heart of its action and not corporate profits. So we'll see, but I'm excited. That's a very positive note to voilà. conclude on. Uh, uh, Philippe, um, I said the start I trusted you. I'm not the only one. I remember I was, met Paul Murphy yesterday from the Socialist Party yeah, yeah. and he was asking for you, he says, he says, I trust, he likes you. And I'm sure Brian Hayes on he that does. plane you met today, I know Brian also would trust you or, or would... If you're going to negotiate, no, he won't be there, but um, <clears throat> that majority, that new majority, that negotiation, and we need it on the council as well as the parliament. I know. Truth. I mean, because the council have had all the power in the last while, it seems to me, too much power. And in some ways, the parliament has, has been the key balancing. The parliament has, and it's a lot of the, the areas that I look at, the parliament on climate, the parliament has, has, has led and held the line Absolutely. more than the council. On migration as well. On digital, it's not a small issue. The Parliament mm. has led rather than the Council. On, uh, on CAP at the moment, it's probably the Parliament rather mm. than the Council. There are so many examples, if you go through each area, where, where do we build the majority as we invent, and we have to invent, this new economy that builds community and that values other than material or profit mm. measures. Um, I think you're going to be, I hope, uh, a real asset in that, that next five years, hopefully in some of those negotiations. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming here today. I thank think you. it's been really, really useful and interesting. And uh, we look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.